Once upon a time, there was a girl who used the power of song to tell the world the truth about herself and her people. Her name was Miriam. Miriam was born near Johannesburg, South Africa in 1932. Her mother was a nurse who became a spiritual healer and on the side she brewed up beer to sell to her friends and neighbors. But at that time, Miriam's country was ruled by British colonizers who made laws that only applied to the black population. One of those laws was no alcohol. When Miriam was just 18 days old, her mother Christina was arrested for illegally selling her homemade beer. Together with her baby daughter, Christina was locked up. Miriam spent her first six months in her mother's arms behind bars. It was this early experience and many more that came after it that gave Miriam a strong sense of justice, injustice, and the importance of freedom for all people. I am Zozimini Tunzi and this is Goodnight Stories for Rebel Girls, a fairy tale podcast about the rebel women who inspire us. On this episode, singer and activist Mama Africa herself, Miriam Makeba. In Miriam's home growing up, there was always music. Her mother and father were both accomplished musicians. And just as she was taught to walk and talk, she learned her melodies. She learned songs in African languages like Isikosa, Sesutu, and Isizul. And she learned songs in English too. And as she grew, so did her voice. But those early years were not easy. Her father died when she was very young, and her mother went to work as a maid many miles away. Miriam was sent to live with her grandmother. The separation was so painful. But there was something that made being away from her mother a little easier. Singing. Miriam's grandmother was completely devoted to her church and sent Miriam to a school run by Methodists. It was there that Miriam fell even deeper in love with singing. She would sing and sing, weaving the languages that surrounded her into magic. And someone took notice. When she was just six years old, the head of the school choir heard her singing and asked her to join the other singers. So she did. Imagine her there, her wide, bright smile, her eyes shining while she lifted her voice too big for her body. Up, up, up. Miriam found that when she sang, people listened. And there was power in that. As Miriam grew up, she never stopped singing. But even though she was just a teenager, she had to make a living. So she began working with her mother, cleaning homes of white South Africans. It was hard work. Remember, this was the 1940s. Not many people had things like dishwashers and vacuum cleaners. Everything was done by hand. And then, when Miriam was 16 years old, Things got even harder for her and her family and other black people in her country. In South Africa, white people had all the power in the government, even though they only made up 20% of the population. The government passed a series of laws called apartheid. It meant that black people and white people had to stay almost completely separated. Apartheid had been practically unofficial in South Africa for a long time, but now it was the law. It made it even more dangerous for Miriam's family and the black community to live. They couldn't leave their homes at night or socialize with their white friends or travel easily around their own country. This filled Miriam and others with sorrow and rage. And for many people, the outlet for this was music. 
jazz music. As the oppression of black South Africans worsened, the music scene got bigger and bigger. It was a way to say in song what they could not say freely. And Miriam would soon become one of the loudest voices in this choir. In 1950, Miriam was 18 years old. She had briefly married a man who, by most accounts, was not a good guy. Miriam had given birth to a daughter, Bongi, who would also grow up to write and perform music. They lived in a place called Sophia Town, and Sophia Town in the 1950s was hopping. The sound of Quella music with its distinct penny whistle sound mixed with jazz and big band and music flooded the streets. Miriam joined her cousin's band, the Cuban Brothers, and started singing all over town. Her talent was undeniable and she quickly became a fixture on the scene. But it wasn't until Miriam was asked to join the Manhattan Brothers, one of the biggest bands around, that her career really started to take off. She had a big hit with the band and the next thing she knew, she was a star. But Miriam had even bigger dreams. In the Manhattan Brothers and most of the other bands she performed with, she was the only woman. But she wanted to change that. She decided that she would start her own group, The Skylarks. Miriam and The Skylarks recorded an album in 1956 and it was a huge hit. They became one of the biggest bands in the country, touring, selling albums and selling out venues. But it wouldn't last. In 1959, at the age of 27, Miriam was selected to sing in the anti-apartheid film, Come Back Africa. The film got a big reaction across the world, and Miriam was set to attend the film premiere in Venice, Italy, and then on to London and New York City to perform. With every song she sang and every note that passed her lips, she summoned the style and story of South Africa. Miriam was singing the truth of her people to an international audience, and the government did not like it. They accused her of being too political through her music. Miriam responded, I don't sing politics. I merely sing the truth. But while Miriam was away from South Africa, something terrible happened. In 1960, the South African government violently put down a protest in a township called Sharpville. 69 peaceful protesters, including Miriam's two uncles, were killed. Then a few days later, she got the news that her mother had also passed. She wanted to go home. But when she tried to, she discovered that her South African passport had been cancelled. The government had banned her from coming home. It was heartbreaking. When you're banned from your home country, it's called exile. And Miriam would be exiled for 30 years. If the South African government had thought that exiling Miriam from her homeland would keep her quiet, they were wrong. She sang even louder. Before her exile, Miriam sang fun songs and love songs. After, Miriam sang about the oppression she and other black South Africans felt. Dressed in the colorful traditional clothing of her homeland, Miriam took to the stage night after night. With beaded hair and thick glimmering gold and silver jewelry, she looked like a powerful queen addressing her kingdom in song. Miriam sang of her exile and sorrow and of the joy of her homeland and audiences embraced her. She became a huge international star 
bringing the sounds of her beloved South Africa all over the world. It was a time of high highs and low lows for Miriam. In 1960, she recorded and released her first solo album and was nominated for a big American award called the Grammy. She performed for President John F. Kennedy in 1962. In 1963, she even spoke to the United Nations about the situation in South Africa, asking people how would they feel in the same situation. I ask you and all the leaders of the world, would you act differently? Would you keep silent and do nothing if you were in our place? Would you not resist if you were allowed no rights in your own country. Miriam also found a close group of friends in New York where she settled, other people who had been forced to leave Africa. They included the jazz trumpeter Hugh Masegela, who would become known as the father of South African jazz. Hugh was also exiled from their country. Miriam and Hugh became close, marrying in 1964. They would be married for just a short time, but they would perform together for decades. In 1965, Miriam finally won a Grammy after several nominations. And then in 1967, Miriam would release her biggest hit to date, Pata Pata. Pata Pata is a song of celebration sung in the distinctive fashion of her Tosa language. It's catchy and fun, but it didn't hold the same meaningful message as many of her other songs. No matter, Miriam thought, the more they listen, the more they will learn to love South Africa like I do. In the 1960s, the United States was also going through some very big changes. People were demanding an end to the inequalities Black Americans faced. Miriam's outspoken activism grabbed the attention of Stokely Carmichael, a renowned but controversial Black power activist. In 1968, Miriam and Stokely were married. Miriam was at the peak of her career, with record contracts and tour dates scheduled far into the future. But as soon as word got out that she had married Stokely, her contracts were cancelled and her opportunities in America began to dry up. Miriam wasn't about to stop performing. She didn't stop speaking the truth when she was exiled from her country. And she wasn't going to stop now that people didn't like who she was married to. But things got more complicated. She and Stokely took a trip after they got married and the U.S. government refused to let them back in the country. So Miriam returned to Africa. Not her beloved South Africa, but to Guinea in West Africa, where she would stay for the next 15 years. It was now that Miriam earned the nickname that would become her legacy, Mama Africa. She performed all over the continent at events that celebrated freedom for all Africans. She continued to lift her voice and fight for equality for all. But she would always miss her home, South Africa. Finally, in 1990, at the age of 58 and after 30 long years of exile, Miriam was allowed to return home. An update officially ended a year later. The airplane landed on the tarmac and the tires squealed. Mama Africa stepped out of the plane. The smell of rain-soaked earth filled her lungs. She was home. The first stop Miriam made was to her mother's gravesite. She sat down on the earth as if it were her mother's lap and told her mother everything, sharing all the stories she had wanted to share over the lifetime they had been apart. 
Miriam Makeba passed away in 2008 at the age of 76. She left behind a legacy of hope and bravery, a legacy of song and perseverance. Mama Africa bravely spoke up about injustices she witnessed and her powerful voice was the voice of freedom. Her music spoke for the weary, the angry, the suffering, and the oppressed. Miriam knew that honesty was power. She held the truth in her heart and shared it with courage and a strong, beautiful voice. Mama Africa spent her life in song and her memory sings on. This podcast is a production of Rebel Girls. It's based on the book series, Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. Executive producers are Jess Wolf and Katie Springer. This episode was produced by Isaac kaplan Woman. Corinne Peterson is our production manager. This episode was written by Grace Boyle, proofread by Ariana Rosas. It was narrated by Zosie Beanie Tunzi, who we will get to know better on Thursday's episode. Sound design and original theme music was composed and performed by Electra Barjaki. Final mix by Mattia Marcelli. For more, visit rebelgirls.com. Until next time, stay rebel!